While it's better than the first two scenarios, there's a problem. The problem is that I'm limited in my understanding. See, because, because God is a God of uh, intentionality. He's a God of creation. And he creates with purpose because I don't know, and I'm not at his perspective. I don't know the purpose for which I've been created, nor do I know my potential. So though I look into myself to try and figure it out, I'm always going to fall short because my knowledge is limited. But the next point, the next place when the Spirit of God begins to move and operate, you begin to look up. You begin to look at the Creator who created you to find purpose and meaning for your life. Only the Creator knows the reason for the creation. You don't ask the Creator thing why I was created. You ask the person who created it why I was created. You know, sometimes you'll, you'll take things, and I'm, I'm horrible at this particular element. I'm horrible when it comes to getting a new product. I just got a coffee maker, for goodness sake. Fake. It's not a Keurig. It's like the cheap Keurig, like the really cheap one. And I don't, maybe this is a man thing, I'm not sure. I never read the instruction on anything. Preach, Marshall. Preach, brother. Come on now. <laughs> My assumption is that I can take it out and operate it, and it works. Now, my wife's different. She'll check it out and make sure it works right. But I don't, I don't want to be bothered with that. But the problem with that is that when you don't read the instructions, you have a couple of issues. One, you have a tendency not to get the maximum use out of the product. Right? Two, you have a tendency to misuse the product and break it. So it's important to go to the instructions. Who wrote the instructions to the product? Well, who created the product? So if God is my creator, and I need to understand how to get the maximum use out of my potential, then I have to go to my instruction manual. That's right. And when we don't go to the instruction manual, we don't get our potential manifested, and we have a tendency to abuse, misuse, and destroy the product. Yep. I found myself in a very low spot. I looked like a snapshot to those around me, but I was in a low place. I was depressed, I was hopeless, I was broke, I was busted and disgusted. And that's where I was. And a very simple, it's amazing how God speaks in simplicities. We tend to look for the extravagant move, but it's the simplicity that he speaks loudest. And it was one little, one little phrase from Psalms, the book of Psalms, on the very first chapter. In the third verse, it's only a phrase that for some reason hit me. And it simply says, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Now, this concept of potential, what I realized is that the tree didn't begin like that. You see it in its glory when it's fully developed, but it began as just a small seed. Almost unnoticeable. You would never look at the seed and know inside the seed is the tree that bears fruit. You never know that by looking just at the seed. Right? I can't tell what's in you by looking at you because you might still just be in seed form. But inside the seed is the potential that can become the tree. Does that make sense? Oh, yes. I'm not a gardener. For, for God, for God's Lord have mercy, I'm not a this type of stuff. I recall some years ago, I decided I was going to go organic. I was going to plant myself a garden and grow some stuff, right? So, you know, when you go to like the Home Depot or somewhere and they have the seed packages on those little spiral things and you spin them around and you see all the stuff on the front of the package, the beautiful tomatoes and the peppers and all that stuff. And that's what I was going to grow all that stuff on the front of the package. Now inside the package, pull it out, now, I got the seeds all mixed up, so I can't tell which seed is which now. But I can't identify the product by the seed, right? So now I have a package with a picture on the front of this product, this beautiful thing I plan on growing. I have a seed in my hand that I can't identify. So guess what? Can't be that difficult. Throw the seed over there, put some dirt on it, boom, it grows to my tomatoes, good to go. But guess what? There was a problem with that scenario. Because on the back of the package, it tells you what kind of soil to put the seed in, when to plant it, how far to space it out, all that good stuff. I didn't forget that stuff. I was still in the ground. So guess what happened to my seed? Nothing. <coughs> nothing happened. The weeds grew all over top of the stuff. I had nothing in there. Right? So it's critical to understand inside the seed is potential. This is amazing to me. The actual seed inside lays a dormant plant embryo inside of every seed. 
And that plant embryo can remain dormant for years until it's activated. Right? Watch this. When you take the seed inside the shell, the embryo that's dormant is placed in the right soil, in the right place. The shell on the seed is activated by water. And when the water touches the shell, it begins to swell the embryo inside the seed. And the, and the embryo begins to grow inside the seed till it cracks the shell. Now watch this. You and me, as seed, when we come into contact with the Word of God, there's something that is stirred inside of us that begins to expand and grow and makes us uncomfortable in the place where we are. But there's something that bothered me about this. Because well, here I am now, trying to follow your will, trying to walk in your way, and yet I'm here in this very dark and lonely and discouraging place. I'm in the soil, like a seed in the ground, where it's dark, it's cold, it's lonely, and it's difficult. I would guarantee that almost everyone here has been in a place, if not before, maybe now, maybe later, where you have been around your family, your friends, your environment, and yet been utterly and absolutely alone. Up, absolutely alone. Just like that seed filled with potential stuck in a dark, cold soil. There you are. Now something that, that happens interesting, like I said, the water breaks the shell and the seed inside begins to swell. And guess what happens? It begins to grow down. The roots grow down deeper into the soil first. There's still no signs of growth. There's still no signs visibly of what's inside the seed, but the seed cracks and goes down into the soil, the roots. So you're still in this place, but God's working on you. So he's working on you in ways nobody sees or knows, but you can feel the pressure and the discomfort of him working on you. God, I'm praying, and I'm worshiping, and I'm serving, but I'm still feeling the pressure. God is working on you while you're in this soil because he's going to get this potential that's inside of you out by putting you in this position. And now the roots begin to grow down. Now this is what's amazing to me about this. No matter what way you put the seed in the ground, it always knows which direction the roots to grow down. Well, why? What's the significance of the roots? See, the roots grow down first because they, they, they are going to provide stability later. See, if you grow up out of the ground without the roots and you become visible without the roots and undeveloped, you're going to fall, waver, burn, and die. But see, when God has potential in you, right, he's got something for you to grow into. He's got to make sure that your roots are deeply planted and firmly into the ground so when you begin to sprout, you're able to stand firm because your roots are there. See, this is the thing. If you're going to need strength to get where you go, he puts you in a, pl in a place that challenges your strength. Yep. That place is difficult. That's right. You're going to need patience to get where you want to go. He puts you in a place that challenges your patience, right? You're going to need courage to go where he wants you to go. He puts you in a place that challenges your courage. And those places are difficult. Those places are hard. Yes. Yes. Those places are in the soil. When you get to that place, you bear down and you trust and believe, Lord, I don't understand the fullness of my potential, but I feel you working with me in this difficult situation. I believe if I stay with your word flowing into my spirit, I will grow. There's another element that's essential for the potential that's in the seed to come out of the seed. Not only the environment of soil, the water, but it needs the light. It needs the light. This is amazing to me about the seed because in the seed there's the embryo, there's a small little component in the seed. It provides a little bit of energy. And that energy moves the seed a little bit. God's given us some energy, but not enough. That's why you can't move on your own. You need the light. So now as this thing grows out of the ground, this little small little green spout, what happens now is that this potential inside the seed is empowered by the light. <laughs> God, family, I hope, you, I hope you understand where I'm trying to go with this right here. The, the light 
is what, what drives the growth of the potential in the seed. Amen. You can't go but so far on your own. You go a little ways, but you can't grow to your full potential without a consistency of the water of God flowing into your life. You can't go but so far without the consistency of his light moving into your spirit. So now you begin to grow. Right, now you begin to move out of the soil and begin to be visible to those around you. Nobody can see you in the soil. Nobody can see what you were when you were just in seed form. But now you begin to grow. Now you begin to grow. about God's operation as you grow and you eventually develop into whatever, whatever it is that you put into the seed for you is that the tree and the fruit is never for the tree's benefit. The tree doesn't eat its own fruit. It doesn't rest under its own shade. Your life is not for you to benefit. He uses you. He puts potential in you. He works you to grow to show forth his glory yes. that others might feed off of that tree and know his sweetness from your life. Too frequently what happens is we are so focused on what we want to obtain for ourselves that we forget the purpose so we only go a little bit and we find ourselves destroyed like a, 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 a drought that lacks water. We grew for a little while and we died and burned out because we forgot our purpose. Let me encourage you. Let me encourage you. Never forget that God is a God of intentionality. That your life is not meaningless. Your life is not purposeless. Your life has power and potential. The manifestation of that power lies in God's word operating in your heart, his spirit operating in your heart, and you opening yourself and being willing to let him do his work. So if you're in the soil, stay there. Don't run away from the difficulties. Let it, let, it, let, it, let it build patience and strength in you as you sit in that place. Let his word operate. Let his spirit operate. Father God, I ask you to allow your spirit to move in this place. Let your light shine in this place. Let your word flow to the hearts of your people, Father God. That we might be who it is you have designed us each to be. That we might benefit those with whom we come in contact. That your glory might be seen in our lives. If you don't know this water, if you don't know this Christ, you don't know this spirit of the living God, I implore you and encourage you to open yourself and submit yourself to this power, this spirit, and this word that you might be who God has called you to be, that you might have fulfillment in your life. Leslie, I thank you for having me. Church, I thank you for having me. Amen. back 
of what you see on a day-to-day -day basis in your job and maybe some encouragement that might go out to the people here or whoever's watching about how we can affect, especially the youth, you know, to change people's lives, to understand, to see. I guess what I'm getting at is there are a lot of people, older and younger, but especially younger, that have no idea that they have promise and potential. And then when they get to our age and up, and they still don't believe it, it's almost like they feel like it's too late. Right. So I'd like to, to know from you, if you don't mind, if you sure. share for a minute. Absolutely. Just kind of like your observation. I know you gotta be careful what you say, but, yeah, I'm, I'm, but I'm, just, an, I'm an expert at this <laughs> I've been in trouble enough times. So yes. But you what you know, like, share, share that for a moment. I'll just stand on the side here. Well, my background is difficult in many respects. Just, it was difficult. And um, I got myself into some difficult, unnecessary situations as a young man with father wounds and father issues and finding a, a killing for that in the streets and with alcohol, with all kind of activity that was trying to heal those wounds. So I understand how it feels to be in that place. I never felt like I, I didn't have anything, but I felt like I didn't know how to get there. So all those experiences, Pastor Stephen, I'm blessed now to be in a position of, of influence and of high visibility, and with the blessing of that is a tremendous burden as well. But I understand that, and I also understand that by seeing someone somewhere who has been through something like you've been through has a direct impact and correlation they can relate. And I don't speak to people with scriptural context and language, but I let the light of Christ speak through me in my everyday life. Amen. And my work and the legal system is, is simply a reflection of the position God has given me to do his work. And while I'm doing it professionally, I want to do it in a way that glorifies him. Yeah. You know, and I think, I think as Christians in general, there's a, a, a misconception that the bulk of the work is done inside the framework of the building, or it's done from the pulpit, or it's done from the choir, but the reality of it is that it's done from working in people's lives, whether it's in your home, your neighborhood, your job, you know, in a way that they can see Christ in you. And by doing that, they come to Christ through you. And that's all I'm trying to do, Pastor T. I'm not to ever try to, 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 in fact, my wife, I'm an introvert, man. I, I'm a quiet, she'll tell you, I'm a quiet, um, to myself in the closet guy. I can hide in the closet all day and not see anyone. I'm an introvert. So why God gave me a platform to be an extrovert, I, I don't know. I don't really like it, but nonetheless. <laughs> So that's, that's, that's the, the best answer I can give you. What I see is hopelessness, man. I see people who come in more literally lost. I mean, I mean literally, not metaphor, I mean literally lost, who don't know which way to go one day to the next. And who, whatever struggles and influence they have, that's the direction they go. Whether it's into drugs, whether it's into promiscuity, whether it's into crime, whether it's into despair, they take the route that's attra most attractive because they're lost, man. Nobody wants to be there. Right. Nobody wants to be there. But when you're lost and there's no real light in your life, you go to the strongest influence. And that's, that's what I see. I don't see this in the black community, the white community, the, the Hispanic community. I see it in people. Yes. I see it in people. You know? And that, that's, 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 that's what hurts. And it's so painful from the position to look down and see it day in and day out. And that while it, the burden of that is very heavy, the resolve to do something all about a God uh, makes makes stronger to try and do something to influence the, those people. So maybe that, I hope that answers a somewhat yeah, of yeah. the question. Yeah. Well, I wanted the extra insight because I want people to understand because again there's stereotypes mm -hmm. that could be with you know you're in front of a judge and you know many times you see these judges that are like you know throwing the book at people and so forth and some do. Good point. But at the same time you know it's like, kind of like saying all pastors are, uh, all men are, our women are. All judges are, and I, I, I hope that we try to work on breaking down stereotypes because everybody is individually made and they have a purpose. But the things that we see on our levels that God has given us, it, it, it wears on you after a while. And, you, and some of you that hear me week in and week out preach, you hear it from my heart, and sometimes it affects me. And I'm asking you guys, how can you help a poor pastor? Because I'm like limping to the finish line. It has a great effect on everyone. And so how do we start new thinking and new uh, things with young people to start new generations 
so that when they visit you and I, it's a, hi, how you doing? And how can I help give back? Instead of, I'm lost, I need help, whatever. And everybody here, and everybody that's listening, can make a difference. Absolutely. So I thank you for all the work that you do. And you know, I know that you have uh, you have a whole side story that I, I need to hear more of. Right. I got bits and pieces of <laughs> how you became a judge. Right. Oh, and then the Ill, was it illness that you had to have? Uh, oh man, listen, I I could go on for days about that version okay. and the problems and anything from health and financial. I'm using that though for another half an hour, bro, so I can sit back down. You, you, you name it. Um, God has just always found a way. My wife was a great witness to it because she watches it from a very close perspective. Our God has operated, and I mean, I've had some tremendously uh, difficult problems with health and illness. Um, financial, we were eating out of the cabinet, looking for cans of beans and dry bread. We were really broke. The people saying, "Now this lawyer is doing well." I was struggling, man. I dealt with incredible bouts of depression. I mean, debilitating depression. People I never knew I was suffering with that kind of stuff, you know? Because they would see the outside and see the title and see the position and not realize that this guy's dying inside. Wow. So there was a lot of adversity that I, that I had to deal with, which is why now I'm so uh, uh, aware, you know, of my own fallibility. I'm only I'm aware of my own weaknesses because I know where I come from. I know what I've been through. So there's no sense of arrogance or pride because I have no right or reason to be arrogant and proud about anything. You know, and, and so to, to bring it back into the professional element, one of the things about law is this concept of justice and mercy. Right? And I keep this perspective in my mind, Pastor Steve, because I don't want God's justice. I can't handle it. I can't take it. When I see people scream out for justice, 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 I said, do you really want justice? Because justice is when you get exactly what you deserve. Everybody gets exactly what they deserve. Do you really want that? Nope. See, when you start pointing a finger, I look at these people here, I look what they're doing here, I demand justice. Well, guess what? While you're demanding justice, in the mirror, you're also demanding justice. And I can't take that. Yeah. I can't get what I deserve. Because what I deserve is, I don't want that. I need mercy. Amen. I need God to give me what I don't deserve and ignore what I need that. Yep. So I try to operate in a way that's non judgmental. Well, I'm dealing with the action. I don't want to be judgmental with the person. I think that's important for all of us because we may have a tendency to get arrogant as we get older, think we know more than what we actually know, and treat people a little bit lesser than sometime based on where they are. And if you realize that God has been very merciful to you and me, it kind of changes your perspective. Amen. And I think, I don't want God to humble me anymore. I'm pretty comfortable. This <laughs> <laughs> I mean, humbling hurts quite a bit, so I'm going to stay there on my own, you know. So, yeah. Well, I, I, it's a great perspective. Yes. Let, let me let me just have a little uh, fun with you, okay? No, 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 scream up with it. Uh oh, kind of. Oh, uh, so see, this is my boy, man. I don't know what the, I don't know. So what no, 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 no. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna go we're gonna go the wall here, okay? So most people don't understand that there was ten commandments in the Bible on the Old Testament, but there was actually it was believed to be six hundred and thirteen laws. Can you imagine that? Being a Jew, living in a new nation that God was forming to be to, to be the light into the world, and there were 613 laws that you had to follow. And if you didn't follow them correctly, there was a potential that you could lose your life. <laughs> now, I know, I know that many of us, when something happens to us and it's wrong, what's our first inclination? We want justice, don't we? If somebody breaks your window, you know, you want to pay for it. And if somebody hurts your family, you want them either behind bars or you want to watch them die a slow death. I mean, let's be real. Now, if you're Christian, you just add in Jesus' name to the end of it. You know what I mean? But, but, but I'm saying, like, you know, when you, look at the, when you look at the Ten Commandments and you look at some of the things it says not to do, every day we're a lawbreaker. The book of James, he writes and says that if you break any laws, you have now been deemed a lawbreaker. Which means that if the judge gets you in front of his court and the police officer said, look, I'm going to tag you going five miles an hour over the speed limit. And you said, why? Everybody else is doing it. But today happens to be your lucky day. <laughs> There's no way around it. Even if he cuts you a break and says, look, it's only five, you're still a lawbreaker. 
The Word of God sets it up and says this. There is no one, no one, perfect. No one can do it all exactly without some sort of breaking of the law. So if you've lied, there's never anything I ever read in the Bible that said little white line. You're a liar. <laughs> You're a liar. It's that simple. Now that's hard, that's hard to digest. It's hard to swallow, yeah. Right? And so you start breaking these laws. Now figure the, do the math for me, because you have horrible math. It runs in the family. So let's just say you break one law a day. Okay? Just one. 365. We got 365, right? I can handle that. <laughs> but go further. 365 times you've broken the law. Okay? Times two. Oh, come on now. Help me out. Somebody, anybody, do the math, please. Somebody, get the phone out. Yeah, get the phone out. 730. 730. Okay? Another year. 365. It's about 1,000. We're about right? A little bit more than that? So, okay, so, so picture this. If you were to break the law a thousand times and you were brought before this man here, Okay? You were brought before the judge and you said, hey, what's the big deal, judge? I broke the law a thousand times, so what? I mean, everybody goes, you know, and drives around the, the cars turning and making a left because you drive on the shoulder of the road. You know, that's illegal, right? But everybody does it. My wife got nailed for it, by the way. Shh, don't say nothing. Okay? Long time ago. Long time ago. The galaxy is far, far away. So, so the bottom line is, do you think he wants to hear that? If he's got to do his job, he's got to administer. He's saying, you're a lawbreaker. And now you don't have a lawyer. And you're stuck by yourself. And you think that the judge is just going to go, hey, look, everybody else is doing it. So therefore, we're just going to wipe it away. This is where the gospel comes in. This is where Jesus, the great lawyer, comes in and says, Amen. Judge, I come to pay for his, for his violations. Mm. I'll go behind bars for him, set him free. Mm. Does that make sense to you? Mm. So, like, if, if, if I were to be Jesus, oh God help us, okay? <laughs> and, and I'm standing next to, the, to you, any of you, and here's the judge, and, and, and I say, listen, set him free, judge. I'll take everything that he, that he violated the law for. Give me the penalty. And you said, very well. Walk me down to the, to the cell, put me in there, and set you free. That's what Jesus did for us. So you really love that guy. Amen. You'll love him forever. Because you don't have to pay the time. Now, that doesn't give us a free right to just act the way we, we want to do. That's called grace. But if you don't accept him, you're still under law. You're still under it, which means that this happens. So I'm the said person. Judge, come on, man. Everybody breaks the law. Justice. <laughs> right. and, I got, and I got no recourse whatsoever. So they haul me off, and I'm yelling in the background, I'll get you for this, and uh, 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 I hate you, you don't exist. You don't exist. Yeah, you do. I'm looking right at you. And the law exists. It was created by lawmakers. And so I still have to answer for it. It doesn't matter if I think he exists or not. It doesn't matter if I think that everybody else is doing it, so I should get a free pass. I'm still guilty. I'm a lawbreaker. I'm gone. And now I've got to do my time. That's the gospel. It's not about forcing people to come to church and then you're a good person and that's it. Nobody can possibly be good. Not in the eyes of God. He made it that way. From the fall, from the, ver the very first two chapters of Genesis, when the fruit was picked and eaten and disobedience came, there was a curse put on this earth. And the only one that's going to lift it is Him. Which explains why we have a whole bunch of nonsense going on in the world. They would, you look around and say, well, why is this person here? Or why didn't he answer this and not this or whatever? I don't have all the reasons for that. Do you still need me, Pastor Steve? Yes. <laughs> I'm bless you out your intro. Okay? okay? <laughs> the judge still stands. You're not going to get away with it. 
And listen, there are people on this earth that walk around thinking, I got one past the judge. You might have got one past the earthly judge, but you're not going to get one past the, the godly judge. And I'm not trying to say this to scare people into it and, and, you know, it's like fear God, like go like this or else. That's not the point of this. He's trying to have you realize, God that is, that he loves you so much and has a purpose for your life that he does not want you to go in your own way. You don't have to do that. And that if you want his grace, I mean, what do you think Christmas is all about? Besides toys. <laughs> it's about giving. Now, some people, they're like, well, what am I getting? And that's fine. But really what it's all about, God gave his only son. He gave everything. Everything for us. So he gave. You will have no reason when you stare before your maker one day to say, I didn't know after today. You won't be able to, after this is all said and done, and say, I didn't hear it. I didn't know. And you know what he's going to do? I love you, but away from me, I knew you not. And unfortunately, right now, there are people that are in that camp that there's, it's too late for them to turn back. There's no turning back now. There's no turning back. Did you guys hear me on this? Yeah. Yes. There is no turning back once that coffin is shut. Once you take your last breath, that's the end of it. So the judge is just following procedure that he created and said, this is what I got going on. I'm sorry, but you're a lawbreaker. And you didn't want the free attorney that I gave you? Okay, have it your way. And that's the sad part. Because everyone is loved by God. He didn't just put you here and say, figure it out. He didn't do that. Look at the complexity that the, that the judge said, talk about the seed. Something so small and so minuscule, he did an entire sermon out of. And we don't even think about it, do we? But here's the great message. For God so loved the world. That means all of us. That means all of us. For God so loved the world. The world. That means everybody in it. Let me, before I finish that scripture, let me just say this. I know that we live in a screwed up world. I know that we have problems. I know that people do bad things to people, and sometimes for no apparent reason. And they hurt one another, and they speak things against one another. And many of you have already, if you've lived in the world, you know what I'm talking about. And the bottom line is this. The world we live in is not the final deal. There is going to come a day where he's going to make all this right. But in the meantime, he's giving you a reset in your heart if you will accept him into your heart. The love of God is so amazing. And if I had known this when I was a kid growing up in church, growing up in church, anybody, anybody yeah. listening here? Yeah, I didn't know it. growing up in church. What a tragedy, huh? Oh, any Bible verses, but I didn't know that the love of God. The love of God is so amazing and so great, and he does not desire that you be a robot and be forced to him. But if you want to live your life the way you want to, he will give you free reign to do exactly that. But when the end comes, you are gambling with your soul. If I'm wrong, and the judge is wrong, and all we are are just religious fanatics, and we all end up in a box anyway, okay, enjoy the food that will be coming out with you. But if I'm right, there are a lot of people right now that wish they could come back and tell you, don't make the mistake I did because it's too late. The judge has ordered, ordered the, the the, the stamp on it to say this is the final judgment. 
I know people that have looked at me years ago when I was younger and looked at me and said, I want nothing to do with your God. And I said, hey man, that's your call. And they died. It's too late. There's no coming back. I mean, if you believe in reincarnation, I'm not going back as a cricket. I'm just saying. Okay? A cow, maybe, but not a cricket. I'm saying this to close. He loves you so much that he would give his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That means this. Believing in his son is the greatest attorney you'll ever have. And not only that, but he's going to guide you through your life so that when your tree, your inner tree grows, you will grow to be an amazing, and if you've ever seen a big oak tree, oak trees are very hard to move, aren't they? They're huge. I've got them in my backyard. They're enormous. And they have big roots, and they can withstand a lot. And in your life and in my life, if you want to withstand the stuff, the storms of life, you are going to have to have roots. And you can fight it and you can continue to say, I don't need him. Suit yourself, man. It's okay. I ain't mad at you. But sooner or later, that root's going to come up. One wind is just going to go like this and it's going to be the end of it. And I'm praying right now that if you don't know him, if you've never had an encounter with him, all you gotta do is call on him. It's not this big long laundry list of things that you must do to get to him. Oh, go clean up and then come back and see me. Oh, go to rehab for six months or a year and then come back and talk to me and then we'll, we'll, we'll think about the salvation thing. No, he's saying right here, right now, you can, you can, on the screen here, reaching the world, I know there's people on here from other countries because we pray with them every week on Power Hour. So it doesn't matter where you are. You could be sitting in gravel right now in another country because they're not blessed to have tables like this. And just as soon as you hear this message, you can say yes right now. So you say, well, how do I do that? Just like the scripture says. Believe in him. But there's a second part to that, which means repent. Repenting means you've got to change your ways, you've got to change your thinking to say, today I'm going to try to do it God's way. I don't even know where to begin, but mind-wise, I want to try. I want to give it my best to get the water of the seed of the Word of God and start to learn what He has of you. How can you possibly hate, this baffles me, how can you hate Jesus when all He talks about is love? I've never figured that out. You can hate the church. You can hate the things you've learned about church. You can hate about Christians all day long. But how can you love the actual message of Jesus? All he said was, love one another. It's like the cold, quote unquote golden rule. Do unto others as they were doing to you. That's what he says. And why do people walk away? I don't think it's because of him. I think it's because of us. But today, right now, you can accept him. Break your heart right now. You don't need me, but I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And nobody is forced to do this. But if you're really serious, and maybe you do already believe in him, but you need a wake-up call today, maybe this is the one. That you have promise of potential, and I'm not going to preach anymore because that will do my brother a disservice. Because he did a phenomenal job. But that sermon, that sermon, go back and listen to what he said. Because everybody here, everybody listening, everybody in the world has the same seed. Unfortunately, many seeds will die. But the ones that flourish and become great trees will do amazing things in the, in the eye of the storm. Let's pray, guys. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. God, we praise you. The, the love that you have for your children, Lord, is amazing. And we don't know it all. We can't explain you away or why things happen the way they do sometimes. But we do know this, Lord, at the end of the day, 
Your word says that you will never leave us nor forsake us, even in our worst, and maybe even in our, on our deathbed. Whatever it is, Lord, you are still with us. And eternity is way greater than, than the earth and the limited time we have here. But God, if there's anybody here that doesn't know your son, that wants to be a miracle right now, they can pray along in their heart, and it doesn't have to be the exact words, but they can just say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I'm not perfect. And I'm thanking you because you have taken my sin away. You've taken the things I've done against you, whether I knew it or not, and paid the penalty for me. And today I'm going to make a decision to live my life for you, no matter what the cost. And for those that do know you, Lord, they can say something like this. Father in heaven, just thank you for loving me. And thank you that you have given us Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us freedom in you. Not about a rule book, but the, the question begs, what must we do to show love? And God, I just pray that you will teach us these things. That you will allow us to grow, Lord, as the judge said, to become a mighty tree. And when those storms come, Lord, we will stand. And people will see that how can this happen, and it's all out of a little tiny seed. And so, God, as we continue and we, um, we get together in fellowship and prayer and so forth, Lord, I just want to thank you for everything you have done here today, Lord. Everything you have done here in this church, in this community. And I pray, Lord, that as we're marching toward a new year, I pray, Lord, that there are greater things are still yet to come that you're going to prepare us for. And God, right now, I just pray a blessing over everyone here, everyone that's paying attention online. And I just want to uh, put a special blessing to the Witcher family. And Lord, guide them every step of the way when the judge has that gavel in his hands, that he makes the right moves. That he never forgets mercy. He never forgets grace. And God, we just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, um, let me just thank the online audience real quick. Thank, guys, thank you so much for hanging in there with us today. We really appreciate you. Um, please, take a look at the video again. Share it with other people. And um, we hope to see you soon. Stop by. That'll be afterwards. Um, so, stop by and... Um, we love you. 2201 East Main Street, okay? Millville. So in the meantime